Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Heyer. I'm a member of the church's board of trustees and my pronouns are she, her, hers. In response to COVID-19, we here at 2U are doing our part in slowing the spread of the coronavirus. We are continuing to meet virtually using Zoom. We may have some bumps along the way and we appreciate all the grace everyone extends in this moment. Special thanks to our amazing team taking care of all the technology. You will notice that there's a chat feed available for you to interact with. You're welcome to use this to say hello to one another and to share your joys and concerns when we reach that time in the service. When we would traditionally sing together and read things in unison, you're encouraged to do so as well, even though you are on mute. Our voices echo through the world, so we may just hear one another if we listen closely and sing with our full spirit. As things continue to change, we'll be paying close attention to the recommendations of public health officials and respond as quickly as possible. At this time, we recognize that physical distancing in this moment as an act of love and protection. You are not in this crisis alone. Even if we cannot always see each other's faces or clasp one another's hands, we are here. If you have urgent needs, please reach out to Kate Learson, our congregational administrator, and she will connect you with one of our community ministers or lay pastoral team members as Reverend Jason is taking some much deserved vacation and study time. We especially welcome newcomers this morning. During this time of pandemic, finding a new community and making new connections can be challenging. Please know that we are excited to have you and look forward to getting to know you. If you're new to us today, you're welcome to note that in our chat and please send an email to Kate Learson in our office so that she can connect you with our membership committee. You can find more information and announcements in your order of service. Our worship leader today is to you congregant, Pat Wilder. Our worship associate is Margo Horn. Our music is provided by Laura McKee, Tammy Stump, and Carl Kennedy. Our tech team is Christy Grant, Eric Schutzler, Dan Ashley, David Martin, and John Hook. I have one announcement for you this morning, but it's a big one and it's very exciting. This afternoon, with great rejoicing, our congregation will ordain Susan Francis into ministry. This is a sacred obligation of UU members. We hope you will return at 2 p.m. for this happy event. The Zoom link is posted in today's order of service in the chat window. You can find more information and additional announcements in your order of service. And I now welcome Margo Horn to lead our call to worship. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a community of children, youth, and adults, a people of many beliefs and traditions, bound not by the specific list of things we believe, but the values we share. Whether you are joining us for the first time or for the thousandth time, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. Whatever your race, whomever you love, whichever way you move in the world, however much money is in your pocket, you are welcome here. I invite you now to take a breath in and out. As the music begins, let us enter into our worship service together.
Shenandoah, I love your daughter. Thank you, Laura, that was beautiful. In just a moment, I'll ask Julia and Ben to light our chalice, the symbol of our faith. We light this chalice today to illuminate the threads of connectivity to our community, our global neighbors, and our earth. Julia and Ben, will you light our chalice, please? I invite everyone to scroll through your gallery and enjoy seeing all of our congregation singing This Land is Your Land with me. reciting our covenant, the words are on your screen. We covenant to build a community that challenges us to grow 
and empowers us to honor the truth within ourselves. We will be generous with our gifts and honest in our communication, holding faithful to a love that embraces both diversity and conflict. Called by our living tradition, we will nurture spirituality within a vision of the eternal, living out our inner convictions through struggles for justice and acts of compassion. Good morning, everybody. It is time for the story for all ages. So if your kiddos are not in the room, now is a good time to ask them to join you. Today's story is called, If I Were a Park Ranger. Imagine serving as a park ranger for our U.S. national parks. If I were a national park ranger, after going to college to study wildlife biology, conservation, or education, I'd work for the National Park Service. I'd wear a special uniform and a hat and a badge. If I were a National Park Ranger, I'd be part of what historian William Stegner called America's best idea. I proudly continue the legacy begun by people who had a vision of preserving our country's most beautiful, historic, and unique areas. Some people hang pictures of pretty scenery or on their office walls, but if I were a National Park Ranger, I would spend my workday in a place that was beautiful all on its own. If I were a National Park Ranger, I might work in the mountains, in a cave, near a volcano, in the desert, or at the seashore. Maybe I'd work on a ship or at a battlefield near the homeland of an ancient people or at the famous National Monument. If I were a National Park Ranger, I would protect the land, the plants, the buildings, and the wild animals of my park. I'd protect animals in many ways. I'd make sure people didn't get too close to the animals or disturb their homes. I'd make sure people didn't feed them or leave garbage that might make the animals sick. Protecting spaces such as national parks and national seashores serve as living outdoor research, research laboratories. If I were a national park ranger, I might work with scientists to study the areas, animals, plants, water, or soil or I could help with the discovery of fossils or artifacts in my park. I'd help campers, hikers, sightseers, and other visitors to learn about and enjoy my park. Did you know that hundreds of millions of people visit National Park Service sites each year? I might greet guests at the visitor center or lead a ranger talk. I'd meet people from all over the country and the world who traveled to see the treasures of the park. I'd be a great storyteller. I'd learn about the natural history, the human history, and the legends of my park so I could share those tales. I'd tell a few spooky campfire stories too. I know lots about the park's landmarks, plants, and wildlife. I'd even recognize the calls, 
tracks, and scat of most animals in my park, so I could answer any question, almost. I might take people on a tour, on foot, in a tram, or in a kayak. Or maybe I'd lead a tour on snowshoes, or by flashlight, or even by candlelight. Lots of different knowledge and interests could come in handy. I might dress up in old fashioned clothes and portray someone from another time. If I were a national park ranger, I'd always be on the lookout for fires or threatening weather. If I spotted trouble, I'd use my two way radio to report it to the emergency dispatcher. Then the other rangers and I would use our training and experience to keep everyone and everything as safe as possible. But sometimes things still go wrong. Then I might be part of a search and rescue team that saves someone who is lost or in danger. If I were a park ranger, I'd probably spend time outside, maybe lots of time outside in all kinds of different weather. But park rangers work inside too. Some use computers to design exhibits, make maps, write articles, and keep track of endangered animal populations. Others update park websites with information and alerts about closed roads or other issues. If I were a national park ranger, I might leave my park to visit classrooms. I would talk with the students about the wonders of my workplace because our national parks belong to them too. If I were a national park ranger, my park would be cleaner and safer because of me. The animals living there would be stronger and healthier too. And maybe because of all I did, some visitors to my park would experience something astonishing. A moment that could happen nowhere else in the world. A moment they'd remember forever. Then like me, they would want to take care of these very special places too. So yeah, I think someday I just might be a national park ranger. Thanks for joining me today for our story. Each year we make a commitment, a pledge to support the ministry of our church. In addition to this contribution, each Sunday we take a collection so that we can share with those doing justice beyond our church community. While we are unable to come together in person, you can still share your resources. To make your contribution, you can send a text and follow the prompts. We will have the number on your screen as the music plays for the offertory. For month of August, we're sharing our plate with 350.org, working to end the age of fossil fuels and build a world of community-led renewable energy for all. Now I invite you to join me in the reading of our offertory words. The words are printed in your order of service and are on the screen. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm it and enable its participation in the larger world around us. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
I invite you now into the spirit of prayer and meditation. Let us start by taking a breath together. Take a breath in and out. This prayer is the prayer of Chief Seattle of the Suquamish and Duwamish people. Great spirit of light, come to me out of the east with the power of the rising sun. Let there be light in my words. Let there be light in my path that I walk. Let me remember always that you give the gift of a new day and never let me be burdened with sorrow by not starting over again. Great spirit of love, come to me with the power of the north. Make me courageous when, it is cold, when the cold wind falls upon me. Give me strength and endurance for everything that is harsh, everything that hurts, everything that makes me squint. Let me move through life ready to take what comes from the north. Great life-giving spirit, I face the west, the direction of sundown. Let me remember every day that the moment will come when my sun will go down. Never let me forget that I must fade into you. Give me a beautiful color. Give me a great sky for setting. So that when it is my time to meet you, I can come with glory. Great spirit of creation, send me the warm and soothing winds from the south. Comfort me and caress me when I am tired and cold. Unfold me like the gentle breezes that unfold the leaves on the trees. As you give to all the earth your warm, moving wind, give to me so that I may grow close to you in warmth. Man did not create the web of life. He is but a strand in it. Whatever man does to the web, he does to himself. Let it be so. Amen and blessed be. For all the unspoken concerns of our community, we join in solidarity with you. I invite you now to speak the name of anyone you wish to live up to this loving community. At this time, I will light two candles, one representing the joys and celebrations we are experiencing, another representing the concerns and sorrows that we are holding. In a moment, we will hear music, and you are invited to share your joys and concerns in the chat window.
We hold all these joys, celebrations, sorrows, and struggles close to our hearts. Marga Horn will now have our first and second readings. Our first reading is from The Hour of Land by Terry Tempest Williams on her visit to Effigy Mounds National Monument. I believe necessity drives us to improvisation where improbable and sustaining gestures create moments of grace that take care of us. We continue to evolve and transform who we are in relationship to where we are. We do not live in isolation from the physical world around us. Nature beckons our response. It is in the doing, the being, the becoming that meaning is made. What becomes sacred is the act itself, not what remains. Something inexplicable is set in motion. The bears are animated within the landscape. These bears were reimagined in place through a collective belief and need. I do not know why they were sculpted into the being, but their power is palpable. I may be blind to what has been buried here or held inside these effigy mounds for thousands of years, but I can read the landscape like Braille through the tips of my fingers, translating the scripts of grasses into a narrative I can understand. The bears and birds and snakes written on the body of the earth through the hands of the humans who dwelled here in the upper Mississippi River Valley are a reminder that we form the future by being caretakers of our past. And here is our second reading. This reading is from Stuart Udall's letter to his grandchildren on Christmas Eve 2009 from the Hour of Land by Terry Tempest Williams. Whether you are a person of faith who believes the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, whether you are an individual who has had mystical experiences that link you to the network of eternity, or whether you are a fervent conservationist who wants to leave a legacy for your progeny, the earth needs your devotion and tender care. Go well, do well, my children. Support all endeavors that promise a better life for the inhabitants of our planet. Cherish sunsets, wild creations, and wild places. Have a love affair with wonder and beauty of the earth. Good morning. When I first proposed this service, I thought it'd be good to encourage people to make travel plans. But our world is a different place now. We confront illness, violence, and bigotry on a daily basis, and travel has become problematic. Now, more than ever, I believe that we need to see the beauty, kindness, and generosity in our lives, plus a more expanded knowledge of our country's history, what we've done right, and where we failed. And when we're all able to travel again, I hope my talk today will inspire your future plans. In 2012, I retired from my job at Stevenson High School as their career development facilitator. I'd sold my house, sold, donated, or trashed anything that didn't fit in a 10 by 10 foot locker, bought a Prius station wagon, named her Patience, and it began my adventure. First, I needed to make a trial run. It began in an with an article in the U World magazine, an ad for two weeks in Alaska that caught my attention. 
I joined around 30 UUs from across the country who are pictured here on one of our spectacular glacier cal calving trips. We stayed in the homes of UU's congregants and experienced a full schedule of visits, activities in Fairbanks, Anchorage, Denali, Sitka, and Juneau. I contacted three of them from Arizona and Tennessee when I began my trip and they welcomed me into their homes, gave me a grand tour of their neighborhood, and our friendship continues. This is a trip you have to take. Now it's time to plan for the big one. I signed up for the UUR Home, a UU b, &B directory, which I found in the UU magazine. The payments primarily, but not um, always, support UU congregations. Gathered my three indispensable guidebooks, America's National Parks, National Geographic Scenic Highways and Byways, and a U.S. Atlas with a page devoted to each state. I packed up patience, and I began my journey. Relax. I'm not going to treat you to a slideshow of how I spent my 16-month summer vacation. Not even my family would sit through that. You're all familiar with the national parks, so you can get familiar with them quickly using Google. In addition to a spectacular journey for me, it was a time of transition, taking something from each of the previous compartments of my life and discovering more about myself and the world I wanted to know more about. My talk will focus on some of my personal reflections of the, on the experiences I had, the connections I made with the people I met and the places I visited. I tried to put aside any preconceived notions and ideas of, or ideas of judgment and was open to new insights. Remember, except for three instances when my sister-in-law joined me, I was traveling by myself. So I constantly focused on the fact that I'll probably never come this way again. So I tried to eliminate distractions <clears throat> like radio, TV, and newspapers, made a special effort to talk to people along the way and hear their stories. I had no schedule, no timetable. In addition to countless parks, sites, monuments, and forests, I visited 48 states, 49 if you count Alaska, drove 55,000 miles, attended 28 UU churches, and stayed in 19 uh, uh, UU b and In no particular order, here are a few of my stories. I love to drive. It's the best amusement park ever. When, <clears throat> when you stay off the interstates as I did, there are hidden treasures to discover. There's the combination of awe and excitement of a mountain climb, the heart-stopping experience of traversing a canyon's edge, and the peace of driving alongside a meandering river. In addition to the exhilaration, it's also a meditative and contemplative opportunity, a chance to question how the landscape was formed and ponder the miracle of its existence. Cruising along the Theodore Roosevelt Lake, I flipped a coin and decided to go down a washboard called the Apache Trail <coughs> to Mesa, Arizona. A couple I met in the motel said it was a beautiful ride, but recommended taking somebody else's car. Patience wasn't too pleased with me, but at 10 miles an hour, because of the ruts and the potholes, you have plenty of time to notice the spectacular scenery. Some curves were listed as 15 miles an hour, but that would have been speeding. The road goes through Fish Creek Canyon with steep climbs from canyon walls and then deep plunges into beautiful valleys. In Colorado, I went from 6,000 to 8,000 to 12,000 feet along beautiful, scary roads. At times, my tummy exchanged places with my heart, and I thought I should get out and, drop and crawl up on all fours. It was the wild mouse ride, but at 12,000 feet, the roads range from lovely drives through canyons to narrow ones along sh a sheer wall with no center line and no guardrail, looking down 2,000 feet into a valley. It's a very serene feeling, especially when coasting down the mountainside. The roads tack up the mountainside like a ribbon of 10, 15, and 20 mile an hour turns. Once I congratulated my mildly acrophobic self for making it through a narrow, twisty, turny high run, and darn if I didn't turn around and do it again. There are many times I felt I'd wandered into a church. One surprisingly was the day I spent driving through the Badlands. It was like driving through a city of sandcastles. 
palaces, medieval cathedrals, and ancient temples with columns, fretwork, and deeply carved ravines. I decided to see it from both perspectives, so when I reached the end, I turned around and drove back through it. Another was the Redwood National Park. Again, impossible to describe the feeling you have driving and walking through the Redwoods. It's a strange, powerful, calming feeling to them. So tall, straight, huge. Best I can come up with is an outdoor sanctuary. The Redwoods only grow in this coastal area, but they're survivors. <clears throat> living almost 2,000 years. Their thick bark protects them from fires, earthquakes, and floods, and the only things that can bring them down is lightning and old age. It's a good place to contemplate resilience, strength, and endurance. I also felt the need to revisit a more experiential religious event, so I set my sights on Father Merton's Trappist Monk Monastery in Gethsemane Gardens in Kentucky. Mistakenly, took a wrong turn, and I ended up with a Maker's Mark bourbon distillery. But I felt since I was seated next to two nuns in the tasting room, a smidgen might just rub off on me. The next day, I found the garden, and I arrived in time for the afternoon vespers. Although I discarded my Catholic upbringing, the chanting by the monks was transportive. I felt, followed it with a walk around the grounds and found a place to sit and contemplate my experiences. I realized I'd been on the go so much, I found it hard to settle into a quiet time in a resolve to make that time for myself. Let me introduce you to Suzanne in Minnesota. She was my first B&B stay, the confirmation this was a really good idea. We spent part of the afternoon at the community garden selecting items for the evening dinner, where we were joined by four members of the local UU church, some of whom were working on a state representative's candidate's campaign. Together, we diagnosed, solved most of the world's problems. She was a representative of the many people who welcomed me into their homes. Not all the places I stayed arranged a welcome party, but all of them made me feel like a returning member of the family. In Springfield, Kentucky, I was the lone occupant of a Victorian home owned by a UU minister and her husband. She introduced me to Sister Elaine at the St. Catherine Mother House, a remarkable woman in her 80s, who in addition to her many education projects, was also in charge of media education at Notre Dame University for over 20 years. She took me for a tour and explained the history of the college Especially interesting was the organic farm they've been running long before it, was just, it became trendy. They've been chosen to partner with Wendell Berry and make, take it to the next step. Each church I visited had the elements of the familiar UU service and programs focusing on equality, social justice, and environmental concerns, but each had also carved out an area that was specific to its locality. Some examples, like the Albuquerque Church, established a certified wildlife refuge on the grounds, right in the middle of the city. In addition to using it for their Sunday school program, they also invited classes from the surrounding grade schools to make use of it. In Durango, the sermon discussed some of the similarities in some values between the Native American and Christianity. As you know, Indian children were taken from their parents and forced to attend Christian boarding schools. One chief commented, the white man gave us their religion, but forgot to keep some of it for themselves. In San Francisco, I heard a presentation from Daniel Ellsberg, and I think I signed up to pick it at Pelican Bay Penitentiary. San Diego, in addition to a beautiful and moving Dia de los Muertos service, display their music and prayers on a screen in English and Spanish, while the service at Key West had a Rod Serling theme complete with Twilight Zone music. The message was, you're probably not as smart as you think you are. Be cautious of becoming too smug and be open to the unexpected. The church hospitality felt warm. Some invited visitors to stand and introduce themselves. I always added that I brought greetings from Chicago. In Hot Springs, Arkansas, I was invited to join the entire congregation for brunch at a local restaurant after their service. And while in Bennington, Vermont, a couple from the church insisted I spend an evening with them. 
One experience I had in the Badlands highlighted a belief in some of the hard shell fundamentalist culture who believe education interferes with their relationship with God, so it's discouraged. Although a sign said people had been coming from, to the site for 12,000 years, the man next to me corrected that information for his three children. Adam, you know, was born 3,000 years ago, he said. I, I did, however, develop an understanding how these ideas become acceptable. Driving through the Appalachians, I saw how isolated people were and how dependent the families and the communities could become on each other and their church. I visited many Civil War sites on my journey, trying to understand why and how this horrifying event in our history occurred and continues to affect and to divide us now. Andersonville is both beautiful and heartbreaking. Neither side expected the war to last more than a few months, so no plans were made to house prisoners captured. At first, they were exchanged for the promise they wouldn't re-enter the war. That ended when the Confederate soldiers broke that promise and also refused to recognize Negroes as POWs. At one time, Andersonville housed 33,000 on 26 acres, of which 13,000 died of dysentery, diarrhea, and scurvy. The northern camps were equally as ugly, one of which was in Chicago, but none of them compared to the size of Andersonville. After the war, Clara Barton, with the help of a former prisoner, had headstones placed for almost all the, those who died. Each Union state also has a memorial on the grounds. You're seeing the one from Illinois. And today, it's a national cemetery with military burials. Another mem memorable stop was Appomattox Courthouse, where Generals Lee and Grant signed surrender papers ending the war. A ranger portraying in real time a young soldier from the Pennsylvania Infantry. He stopped briefly during his story to investigate the commotion at the house. My tears welled up when he reported that Lincoln had been killed and his hope that Andrew Johnson would continue the path toward reconciliation. I still choke up. There was no high five celebration over the defeat. Grant didn't demand uh, Lee's sword and all the Confederates were given passes and horses to return home. I was saddened by the realization of the missed opportunity for healing that may have occurred with a more competent and compassionate president. There were three parks I knew I had to see, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, and Glacier. The rest were wonderful bonuses. Usually the canyon's north rim is closed by mid-October because of snow, but this year, I was one of seven cars in the parking lot on its closing day, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I walked out to Angel's Landing and felt almost suspended in midair over a chasm. Couldn't even see the bottom or the other side of the canyon. I pondered what it must have been like when the earth heaved and exploded and the strength of a river to carve out this immense gorge. I met a, my, a group of motorcyclists in Utah at a communal rest table restaurant, and they encouraged me to take the red bus over the road to the sun. It's another road with few guardrails and a lot of scenery to miss if you try to drive it first. The beauty of Glacier came with an added bonus. I stopped for breakfast at the Two Medicine Cafe outside the park and noticed an older fellow sitting at the table, and I asked if I could join him. He was a Blackfoot cultural storyteller, and I spent over two hours listening to him talk about being raised by his medicine woman grandmother in the house behind their family ranch. He told me about the Native American religion and the spiritual connection to the earth, the healing powers of the roots and herbs, learning from the animals and the weather patterns, and described step-by-step step the vision quest undertaken by the younger members. He also talked about the lack of credit given to the women of the tribe. I suggested he write that book and dedicate it to his grandmother. His mission was to preserve the language and culture by passing it on to the younger members of his community. Yosemite was our first national park and was begun by the persistence of John Muir and the dream he shared with then President Teddy Roosevelt. A camping trip they shared convinced Roosevelt to set aside this magnificent part of the country 
as the beginning of a system of parks we can all enjoy, a tribute and a lesson of the power of one. Another interesting person I met while I was standing in line at Monticello was a special education teacher from Florida who hops on her Harley each summer and assembles a presentation for her students. She's been doing this for six years and brings a personal story to her class about the historic places she visits. Our teachers are our treasures and every child deserves a teacher like Lori. Since this is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I'll end my stories with the visit to Seneca Falls, home of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. What a whirlwind she was. When she's locked out of the abolitionist conference in London because she was a woman, she returned home and within five weeks, she had a group of five friends organized a conference at, uh, by, that was attended by over 300 people. She joined up with Susan B. Anthony and they became a formidable force Elizabeth, a mother of six, did a lot of strategic and tactical planning, <clears throat> while Susan took to the road, while Elizabeth felt ready to leave her brood and travel. Although Susan never lived to see the passage of the 19th Amendment, she never stopped advocating for it, haranguing Congress every year until her death. My 16-month history, U.S. history education, connected me physically and emotionally to the battlefields of our home fought wars, the sites of historical events and parts of trails like the Oregon and the Trail of Tears. I traveled with explorers such as Lewis and Clark, and I gained expanded knowledge of indigenous cultures, especially the Pueblo and cliff dwellers. The visits to villages, museums, and galleries gave me an insight about a people and cultures through their architecture, art, and artifacts. I'm not afraid to try something different. I know it doesn't have to be a 16 month wrap through the country, but as the books say, choose your own adventure. It strengthened my belief that if you need help, ask. I was the beneficiary of so many kindnesses and helpful advice. I hope I'm even more aware of those who need help and I'm trying to develop a pay it forward attitude. But most of all, there's gratitude. I'm so grateful to so many, more than I can name here, but I wanna mention a few. First to Ken Burns, whose National Parks film on PBS inspired me to make the trip. And to all those who never gave up the dream of having a national park system. I'm grateful to the National Park Service for their programs and ranger walks, where I met some extremely knowledgeable and passionate people who shared the history past cultures, geology of the parks. Sometimes I was the lone visitor and the, and the lone member of the tour, a wonderful opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm grateful to the guides put out by the National Geographic Society with their suggested stops that took me through the most exhilarating heights along river edge valley floors, pine forested and wooded trails, and so many other stunning meanderings. I'm grateful to the small towns who have maintained their historic downtown and museums so visitors can learn about how they came to be. Their collections are extensive and enthusiastic volunteers who keep them open draw you into their story. And thanks to those along the way for the beautiful gardens and deco who decorated their lawns with interesting and amusing objects that brought a smile as I drove by. I'm especially grateful too to the UU hosts who welcomed me into their homes and made me feel like a favored relative and the churches who warmly greeted me and the family and friends who cheered me on and provided lodging as I crisscrossed the country. I also have to include my children who resisted the urge to have me declared incompetent and deranged and stash me someplace where I wouldn't be a danger to myself or others. Their go mom was with me constantly. And finally, I'm grateful for the circumstances that allowed me to do this. We all stand on the shoulders of others who cleared a path and opened doors. This trip changed me, expanded me, and I encourage you to explore, take chances, and take your own path of discovery.
Please join us now in singing our closing hymn. I love to go a wandering along the mountain track, and as I go, I love to sing my knapsack on my back. Valerie, Valerie, Valerie. back. I love to wander by the stream that dances in the sun. So joyously it calls to me, come join my happy song. Valerie, to all I meet and they wave back to me so blackbirds call so loud and sweet from every green wood tree Valerie The skylarks wing, they never rest at home. But just like me, they love to sing as o'er the world we roam. Valerie, Until the day I die Oh may I always laugh and sing Beneath God's clear blue sky Valerie so much. That was wonderful. I invite you to cross your hands over your heart, or if you're with someone close, you may cl uh, choose to hold hands and hear these words of benediction. Henry David Thoreau wrote, we need the tonic of wildness. At the same time, we are earnest to explore and learn all things. We require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable that land and sea be indefinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us, because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. Go forth in wonder and peace. Amen and blessed be.